One more session on topological data analysis. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Good morning. Uh, thanks for being here so early. I'll, I'll continue uh, my lecture on topological data analysis. Uh, yesterday we talked a lot about the algebra, the, the homology, um, the, the barcodes that, that tell us the structure of these persistence modules. Today we're going to look a lot into geometric constructions. You've seen these simplicial complexes overlaid on top of the union of balls. I'm going to uh, start with explaining what exactly we saw there. There's yesterday at the very end of of the lecture, I mentioned a construction, the Vitor's Rips complexes. This is a very simple construction that applies to general finite metric spaces, general distance matrices. Uh, it has, so that's a big advantage that it's simple. It has a big disadvantage that these complexes grow very large, very quickly. And I'm going to start today with showing another construction uh, that's called uh, Delaunay complexes. They are subcomplexes of the Delaunay triangulation, and you might have heard about the Delaunay triangulation or Delaunay triangulations before because they are commonly used in, in various fields. Like yesterday, we, we heard mention of uh, finite ele element method, and you need to triangulate a domain in which you solve a PDE. And the Delaunay triangulation is, is the kind of the, the uh, standard tool for this purpose. Let me show. So, what, what are we doing? This is, as you can see, a point cloud. It's a cloud uh, made of points. and we, we try to, as, as we have seen yesterday, we try to connect uh, the dots in a sense. We try to build um, a space that, that doesn't just have disconnected points, like we consider this union of balls. How do we get the simplicial complex that captures the shape, the homotopy type of this union of balls? We do the following. Whenever we have two of these disks that have a non-empty dissection, then they get connected by an edge. Whenever we have three of them, they get connected by a triangle, and so on. Whenever we have an arbitrary subset of disks that have a non-empty dissection, they get connected by a simplex of the appropriate dimension. As you can see, if I had chosen the radius large enough, then I would get a very large simplicis, very high dimensional. This will not that anymore. But we can do this for all simplices, and you already see that. Now, in this case, I only have triangles, but they already overlap. The simplicial complex is not embedded. There are parts of the plane that are covered by more than one triangle. And that's kind of why, why this uh, construction, this construction is called the Czech complex. And uh, similar to the Rips complex that we saw yesterday, it has the property that it grows very quickly. I, as you can imagine, if I um, increase the radius such that all spheres, uh, all balls have a non-intersection, then I, and I, let's say I have n points, then I have two to the n simplices because all possible subsets appear as a simplex. There's a question here. Yeah, so if uh, four disks intersect, I connect them by a tetrahedron. But that's not a tetrahedron that, that embeds into this plane. So if I draw this tetrahedron here, you will see a squashed version. But what I work with is just the abstract information, these four uh, points span a tetrahedron in some high dimensional space. Exactly. So if the radius is too large, we let's say we have n points, we get an n minus one dimensional simplex. Because two points give a one dimensional simplex, it's always the dimension is one less than the number of vertices. But yes, so, so the point is this construction gives us, you see that that's why we have this overlap. This is a construction that doesn't embed nicely. Uh, you, you see that this is not exactly maybe what you want. This is not a triangulation of some part of the plane, but it's a simplicial complex where I've shown a high dimensional simplicial complex and what you see here is only a low dimensional projection where several things are squashed. It, it can be shown to have the correct homotopy type. So it's a good topological object if you want, but not so good geometrically. It's not really what you want geometrically. So if you look at this picture, you should not be too pleased with 
So it, the good thing about this construction, again, it's very simple. Um, it doesn't take us much to define it, but um, so that, that may be advantages. But, but we, we're going to go to the next construction, the Delaunay-based construction, by starting again, but using similar ideas. <clears throat> Let's uh, throw away everything we did so far, go back to the point cloud, and now we consider first the Voronoi tessellation. We subdivide the plane into regions having the same set of nearest neighbors in these points. So there are, there are these full dimensional cells, two dimensional cells that have a single point in the point cloud as the nearest neighbors. Then there's lines that have two common nearest neighbors. And then there's also these intersections, points of the lines. They have, in this case, they all have three nearest neighbors. If the, in, in the generic case, uh, this, this, is, this is the situation, right? The dimension of, of uh, the cells in this Voronoi partition here that you see um, corresponds to, correspond exactly to the number of nearest neighbors, those points. Okay, so that's the, that's the Voronoi tessellation. And we're gonna use this to cut off the balls. So instead of just considering uh, all balls, uh, so, so first of all, we, we're, before we're going there, let me define the Delaunay triangulation, the entire Delaunay triangulation. Doing the same thing as before now, instead of using the, the disks, I'm using these Voronoi cells. So when I have uh, uh, two points, I connect them by an edge. If I have three, point, uh, three points, and, and they, their closed Voronoi cells have a non-empty intersection, then they're connected by a triangle. And I'm doing this for all Voronoi cells, and it gives me a triangulation of the convex hull of this point set. And that's the Delaunay triangulation. And again, because in the generic situation, if generically the point clouds um, are, give a Voronoi diagram um, where the, the, the dimension of the, Vor the cells in the Voronoi diagram is, is n minus the number of associated points. And that implies that this will, uh, this will actually, in, in the generic case, be an embedded simplicial complex. So in, in, in particular, no more than, in this case, no more than three Voronoi cells will have a non-empty intersection. You can easily imagine in the non-generic case that could happen. You can just place four points on the corners of a square, and then the Voronoi cells would be quadrants in the plane, and you would have four, and they would ha all have an intersection, common intersection at the origin of the plane where all the four quadrants meet. But that's a non-generic situation. You perturb the points on the square, uh, corners of the squ square slightly, and this degeneracy goes away, and you're actually left with a triangulation. And in practice, uh, you, you can't just argue in practice um, this is a, a case that happens with measure zero, because on the computer there's no measure zero, and these degeneracies appear all the time. But what, what is done to resolve the issue is you pretend that there was a, a generic situation. You, you imagine to perturb the points, and then you decide, you, you triangulate based on that uh, simulated perturbation. Okay, so this is, yeah? The, the cells. So, so each of the two-dimensional cells is, is simply the, the set of points in the plane. So to each point there's a cell associated and, and it's a set of points in the plane and have this point in the point cloud as the nearest neighbor. It's closer to this point than to any other point in the point cloud. Yeah? So it's, it's kind of, it's the nearest neighbor partition. And now of course if you, if you have two adjacent domains, there's a line segment or a half line and those are points that have exactly the two, uh, yeah, the, the two points in the point cloud as common nearest, the both nearest. Right? Being nearest is not, uh, is, is not unique in some cases. Right? And then if you have the triple intersection points, they're just isolated points here. They actually have three 
nearest neighbors. And my statement about genericity is you never go higher than three in this case. Or in general, this, this is all illustrated here in the plane. This works in arbitrary dimension. And then the three here is replaced by dimension plus one. So, but the point is then corresponding to that, those uh, intersection points, there are simplices. And, and the dimension, uh, dimension plus one corresponds to the number of vertices. So that's an n plus one vertex simplex and n dimensional simplex. And that, that means, so that translates into the fact that uh, you get a triangulation or when the simplices are not of too high dimension. And with a bit of extra work, you can show that this actually uh, partitions the, the convex hull. How, how you obtain this grid? Uh, well, this is, um, there, there's an in incremental construction. So you, how, how you actually compute this, um, you actually do the computation based on the, the object in front, on the Delaunay triangulation. And in, in a nutshell, the algorithm inserts points one after another and then updates the triangulation. It's a, um, it, 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 is, it is based on searching for, um, so it is based on the fact that each triangle in this Delaunay triangulation has an empty circumsphere. We'll get to that in, in a moment. I mean, so, so, so for now you don't have to, you don't have to uh, see how, how this is computed. It's just, I, I guess, it's enough to understand what, what's the meaning of, of these objects and these cells. They're, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I guess. Maybe I'll say more about this. Maybe maybe we can talk after if if, if there's still questions. But uh, I'll, I'll say some something more that that illustrates how this construction works. Um, okay, and now we are combining the two ideas, right? We, we have seen that both uh, both the Delaunay triangulation and this this Czech complexes were defined using intersection patterns. And we, in the first case, we looked at intersections of disks. In the second case, we looked at intersections of these Voronoi cells. Now we, and now we're taking, uh, like we 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 consider Voronoi disks. Yeah, we take for each point in the point cloud, we take the Voronoi cell and we take the disk of radius r, and we intersect them. So we clip the disks. Now you see you don't have this this overlap anymore. The overlap happens only at lower dimensional pieces, and then we do the same game for the third time. Whenever we have uh, two uh, such clip disks that have a common intersection, we join by an edge. Whenever we have three, we join by a triangle. Again, we don't have to go to higher dimensions. And you get this object here. And this is a more or less nice triangulation um, that, that captures the, the topology correctly. Maybe you're still not satisfied because this triangle shouldn't be there, maybe it doesn't look so nice, but there's also another construction that uh, we will get to in this talk that tells you how to get rid of this. In, in a sense, what you can do is you can take this edge and the triangle and collapse them. That doesn't change the, the topology or the homotopy type of this object. So this is called an elementary collapse. And there's a principal definition of how, how to get this complex here. Now this is called a wrap complex. And this is actually used in, like, this is uh, used in a surface reconstruction method that's by, uh, used in, in, a, in, a, in a product of the company Geomagic. And it's also called Wrap there. Okay. And here's your, here's a nice way of connect the dots to, to get the cloud back if you want. Um, okay, so let me say something about these constructions. Um, I, I mentioned that um, the complexes we construct have the same homotopy types, are in some sense uh, topologically equivalent to the union of balls. So B sub R of X is what I, what, I, uh, what I used to denote the union of balls. And then there's del R, that's the Lidlani complex of radius R, and there's Czech R, these two constructions that I've seen. And uh, a theorem by Borsuk, uh, tells us that these, these are equivalent, but this theorem is a bit, it's not very explicit. It goes a big detour to a, to a 
even more uh, involved complex. Uh, I mentioned that the Czech complex is very big and, and the construction to connect the Czech complex to the union of balls is even bigger. And so this is not a very explicit description. What I want to show you today is uh, just a moment that uh, the Czech complex, which is a high dimensional simplicial complex, collapses in a, in a way we've seen before. You remove pairs of simplices that don't change the topology, and then you collapse down to the nice Delaunay complex that we've seen before. There's a question. So the Czech complex what, was what we have seen at the very beginning. You just look at the intersection patterns of, of the full disks. And, and, and as I said, because the, eventually all disks might intersect, this is the, the very high dimensional object. Right, so this is, the Czech is, is the complex arising as the intersection pattern of uh, full disks, and Delaunay is the one for the clipped disks, where you clip at the Voronoi cells. Yeah. So, the, and, the, and the point here, um, I'm gonna, uh, the thing I'm gonna show you is the, um, the, the, there's actually a collapse there. They're, they're connected in a, in a very simple and explicit way. There's an intermediate object here that I, I call Delaunay check. What's that? I simply take the simplices arising in this check complex uh, of radius r, and at the same time they arise in the, in the full Delaunay triangulation. So this is already restricting myself to uh, this low dimensional setting, and that's gonna be an intermediate object that will appear. And we, we observe already that this is, there is a inclusion relation. So the Delaunay check uh, contains the Delaunay complexes for the same radius. And by definition, they're part of the Czech complex. And, and it, as it turns out, so the question we're gonna look into is, they're, they're related through simplicial collapses. So in a, in a very explicit way, you just throw away some of the, pair, pairwise you throw away simplices of the Czech complex, but all the high dimensional ones that, that you don't need, and then you end up at the Delon Czech, and you can further shrink this to Delon. Let me show, um, First of all, let me go to this definition of what, what these collapses mean. This is an old notion introduced by Whitehead. So here you see it's an example of a simplicial complex. Some points, some edges, one triangle. It, I hope it, it's, it's clear enough. The, the gray triangle on the left, this is filled in. The, the white one is not present. So this is something like a circle with a, with a flag, yeah. um, topologically. Yeah, it has a single hole. And what I want to show is, well, a collapse. I want to collapse away this triangle. Usually, we visually denote this by an arrow. Collapses always come in pairs. There's pairs of simplices, a simplex of dimension k and k plus one. Here, an edge and a triangle. And the arrow goes from the lower dimensional one to the higher dimensional one. And you can imagine, you, know, you, can, you can pull in the direction of this arrow. This is a continuous deformation. It gets you here and then re removes these two simplices. So uh, we, we collapse to a subcomplex, and we, we say we remove a free face. That's a that's a simplex that has only a, a single higher dimensional face attached to it. So the edge has only the triangle as a proper coface, and those this this doesn't change the homotopy type and the homology. And so this is an elementary step, and now you can build uh, together bigger bigger constructions from these building blocks, and that's what we call a collapse, okay? And, that, and, and that's what we're aiming for. We're trying to collapse this, this huge, um, unwieldy Czech construction to the Delaunay construction. Here's a picture of this. This is the main result. On the left, in red, you see a lot of edges, and it's a big mess. And then the second one is this Czech intersected with the entire Delaunay triangulation. You already see that's not the same as the Delaunay complex. Uh, I, I'll get to this in a, in, a, in a moment to make it more clear why these two are different. And then you see that this is still not looking very nice. Um, and then you can further clean up and arise at the wrap complex, which kind of has the, the tightest uh, geometric approximation of these point points. And what this statement says is, topologically, they're all the same. And they're related just by throwing away simplices in pairs that you don't need. So that's this very powerful 
and it's 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 encoded in a single um, in a single combinatorial description called a discrete gradient vector field. This comes from a theory called discrete most theory that I'll introduce in a moment. It's it's very elementary and very explicit. And and this also so this extends to, to weights on the points weighted Lorentz triangulations, and it also uh, these connections can carry over to persistent homology. So so we have connections. Um, between the corresponding persistence modules, and we can these are very explicit, meaning we can use this in in, in software. We can we, we can code the the connection, so we can describe something on the level of check complexes because that's easy to describe, and then we have an explicit algorithmic way of projecting, uh, let's say, a cycle in the check complex down to a cycle in whatever the uh, Delaunay complex, wrap complex, whatever you like. So, so this gives us a, a very good handle on, on different constructions that people in applied topology or applied geometry have used. Okay, so let me just briefly introduce the core concepts of discrete most theory. It, it takes only two slides, really. The fundamental notion is a discrete vector field. So this is supposed to be a discretization of vector fields, but really capturing only uh, some kind of combinatorial essence. You see arrows and, and they indicate somehow direction of the vector field, but there's no length, there's no length information. This is only direction in a sense. And formally the definition is just you partition the simple sets in this complex into either pairs or singleton sets, right? So, and, and whenever you have a pair, it has to be one of these pairs that are, appear in collapses, so it, it has to be a simplex of dimension K and then a co-face of dimension k plus one, a larger simplex attached to, like here, the edge, and together with the triangle. So you see four of these pairs, and again, they're illustrated by arrows, and then there's two simplices that are unpaired. There's this red vertex on the bottom, and this brown edge on top. Okay, that's a discrete vector field, and uh, we call the singleton, um, elements, so this edge and this vertex critical simplices, they correspond to the critical points of a vector field in the smooth world. And they, they, have, they have similar properties. So. And then we also have a notion of gradient, right? Gradient is a vector field that's defined from a function. when You have something like a metric. And, and that goes as follows. So we call, we consider a function on a simplicial complex, that means we assign a function value to each simplex, not just to the vertices. So each simplex gets assigned a function value. And um, here, maybe you don't see a number for every simplex, but that's because I, whenever I have an arrow, I have a pair here, they, they get the same value. So this vertex has a value three, the edge has a value three. So and I missed some numbers, but, but they, they just get the same value. And so I want to have two properties to, in order to call it a discrete most function. If I sweep through the sublevel sets, yesterday we have seen that sublevel sets are important for me. If I sweep through this, I always get a subcomplex. That means whenever a simplex is there, all of its faces, the lower dimensional simplices, also have to be present. In other words, I, if I have an edge with a certain value and the vertices of this edge, can't have a larger value because then it can take a sublevel set containing the edge, but not yet containing some of the vertices. So, in other words, the function is monotonic with respect to this phase inclusion relation. Right? A, 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 any simplex always has a function value greater or equal to each of its faces. And that gives me the first condition. Sublevel sets are always subcomplexes. Whenever a simplex is present, any of its faces are also present. That's just to make things well behaved. And that's just what I would call a monotonic function. The second condition really connects this to discrete vector fields. Simply if I take the level sets, so simplices with the same function value, they give me a partition into a discrete vector field. And that's a discrete vector field I get from the function. It's the, called the gradient. So here, uh, I, I get this partition. Each 
number is assigned to either a single simplex or a pair, and that gives the gradient of this function. There's a question. This function is not unique, no. Any, so, so, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, so there is, right, so your observation is there are many very different, I mean, this is, this is kind of a stretch calling this a gradient uh, because it's, it, it, it's al already not, not unique. The, uh, the, the function is, for a given gradient is also not unique in the, in the smooth case. But the kind of the freedom you have is only you add a constant to the function. Here you have much more freedom. There's plenty of different functions giving the same discrete vector field. Right? That's a very good observation. So in a sense, uh, in often what we, the, the, the powerful tool is the discrete gradient and the function is just used to make sure that what you have is not just a vector field, but it's actually a gradient. The gradient satisfies a certain asymplicity property that the general vector field don't, right? In general vector field, you can have arrows going in circles. And the, the way the, the gradients are defined, this, this can't happen, this is excluded, right? Okay, so, so that, that's a powerful tool, why? Because discrete gradients and discrete Morse functions are a very good language to encode these simplicial collapses that we want, want to aim for. And yeah, so again, sorry, this is the last thing I want to say. We have critical points. Those are the singletons. Their values are, of course, called critical values of the function. Um, how do we encode a collapse with a Morse function or with a gradient? It's a, as follows. I mean, you, you already imagined, that I'm using the arrows uh, twice here in the, in the gradient and also for the collapse. There's a good reason for that. You have a simplicial complex with a discrete Morse function. Now I pick a range of function values that contains no critical value. Let's say the range from two to five contains only um, pairs of, of the function. So, so let's say the, the low bound is excluded. Uh, the range from two to five excluding two contains no critical value and you can convince yourself that the statement of this theorem makes sense. If I take the sub-level set at level five and I remove everything above two, and then removing this is just a collection of collapses. You just have to make sure that you do this in the, in the correct order. It's not hard to do this. So that's, uh, that, that's a statement that expresses a collapse using the function. And I can give you a variant of that uh, notion, but here, for what, what that means, like in topological terms, I can carry out all these collapses and I can bend the, the remaining cells, while well, everything that, that's critical here is not removed in a collapse. But I mean, that's a consequence if I take the, the, the edge corresponding to six and I bend it and everything that was paired is collapsed, I end up with something, now this is not a simplicial complex anymore, something more general, it's called a CW complex, a cell complex. But you see, um, this is obtained from the simplicial complex by just contracting all the pairs, and you remain with something that's actually a circle here. Okay, that's, that's kind of the, the power of Morse theory. This is the kind of statement that Morse theory is aiming for, and we have it here in a combinatorial variant of the, of the theory that gets away without all the nastiness of, of the smooth situation. And here's uh, a variant of the theorem on top that doesn't talk about functions, just about gradients, and that's useful. Uh, and I want you to remember this because that's what we're gonna apply later. So what does it say? I have a pair of simplicial complexes, K and L. K. Uh, it's going to be the sublevel set at level five, and L is going to be the sublevel set at level two, to to make the connection to what happens above. And now the complement of K minus L, the K minus L is just consists just of pairs of the gradient, similar as before, and then we have the collapse. So I, basically, I took the 
the theorem on top and I expressed it without the function values. Because sometimes, uh, as I said before, the function is typically just a vehicle to, to ensure that I have a gradient. And this is a theorem that applies to gradient. Okay, so, but that's kind of what I want to get at. If I have this nice structure of a discrete gradient, I can use it to encode a collapse. And whenever I have a pair of complexes, K and L, and L is the smaller complex, and the complement of L and K consists only of pairs, then I know they, they, are, they are the same. And that's exactly what I'm gonna apply to Czech and Delon. I'm gonna show that between Czech, uh, from Delaunay to Czech, there's only non-critical synthesis. Okay, so here's the collapse. Yeah. Okay, so what are the functions? I, in, here I, I, I'm, I'm defining uh, discrete Morse functions. What are the functions associated to Czech complexes? What are the functions associated to Delaunay complexes? It's very simple. This is, all these constructions are very elementary Euclidean geometry constructions. That's nice about this. So we assume, again, a finite point set in general position. So the, the, in the generic situation, we don't have these not, uh, degeneracies I mentioned before. Yeah, five points here. And uh, the simplicial complexes I consider are the combinatorial type, abstract simplicial complexes. So a simplex of the point set X is simply a non-empty sub subset of X. Th these are basically the points that span the simplex. But I, I have to work with this because, as I said, uh, these complexes will be high dimensional. And, and I'm, I'm working in dimension D, let's say, but I have N points, and this will not necessarily embed in two D dimensions, or in this case, two dimensions. So here's my simplex, an edge, right, illustrated by, by, by the edge. And I consider two functions, and I call them radius functions, because the functions are the radius of certain spheres. The first one that defines the Czech complex is the radius of the smallest enclosing sphere. This is the smallest sphere that uh, encloses both points in the simplex Q. Q consists of these two points. And this, this, is, this is defining, will be defining the Czech complexes. Then there's a second function for the Delaunay that is the radius of the smallest empty circumsphere. Empty means empty of the points in my point cloud. So it's the smallest sphere that contains the points Q on the sphere and no other points of the point cloud in its interior. And as you can see, because I have to avoid the other points, the sphere is a slightly bigger, the Stellani sphere is slightly bigger than the Czech sphere. There's another point pushing the sphere outwards. And in some cases, so for certain subsets Q, I don't have an empty circumsphere. I only have it really for the simplices that appear in the Delaunay triangulation. Yeah, so the Czech function is defined for all possible subsets of the point, and this one it has a restricted domain of definition. And these are the functions that define uh, give me an alternative way of defining Czech and Delaunay complexes as sublevel sets of this function. I mean, the Czech function is simply, or can be shown, I mean, it's not immediate, but you can show that the definition I gave at the beginning of the talk is equivalent to this one. So the Czech complex of radius R consists simply of all simplices that have a smallest enclosing radius of at most R. And I can then restrict this just to the synthesis in the Delaunay complex. That gives me this intermediate Delaunay check complex. And I can consider the Delaunay complex as the sublevel set of the Delaunay function. So the synthesis with a smallest empty circumsphere of radius at most r. And as you can see here, we have seen before that the Czech and the Delaunay uh, spheres might have different radii. The Delaunay sphere has to have a radius at least the one of the Czech sphere. And that's why the Delaunay complex might be smaller than the Czech complex. Because yeah, if I choose a certain threshold, the Czech 
synthesis might be below the threshold, but the Delaunay, uh, the Delaunay function value might be above the threshold. So this is why you see two different complexes. This is a common misunderstanding, I think, to, to assume that these complexes are the same, but here you see a very clear reason why they're different. Because, because these, these two spheres associated by the check and the Delaunay function might have different radii. Okay, so th now, now we took these constructions of Czech and Delaunay complexes and re reinvented them using, using something that fits with Morse theory. We expressed them as sublevel sets of a function that fits well with our general theme, considering sublevel sets. Now, now there's a problem, right? We want to apply discrete Morse theory, but uh, it's not hard to see that these functions are not discrete Morse functions in the in a sense of form and definition. Um, because things don't just appear in pairs, they appear in larger groups. Here's a simple example showing this. So on the left you see a simplex Q, again the same point cloud with a uh, point set with five points. On the left there's Q, on the right there's Q prime. There are two simplices, neither is a face of the other, but if they, but they have the same function value. So that means the, the uh, level sets of this function is not just uh, given by pairs of synthesis where one is a face of the other. The groups, the clusters of synthesis with the same function value can be larger. But uh, fortunately there's a way to generalize a little bit to, to, to save the day. We uh, call this generalized discrete Morse theory. So the, the two authors that, that considered um, this slight variation of the definition now, instead of just looking at singletons and pairs, we allow uh, a more general class of partition. Again, we want to partition the simplices into groups in a structured way. What we consider now is what we call intervals in the phase process. And an interval is given, like as, as for real numbers, an interval is given by specifying a lower bound and an upper bound, L and U. And then I consider everything that's in between. But now this is with respect to the phase relation, the partial order given by the phase relation. So the interval spanned by L and U is simply the collection of all simplices Q that have L as a phase and that are a phase of U, that have U as a cophase. And I, I use the same uh, visual language to describe this. I'm, I'm drawing an arrow from the lower bound to the upper bound. And you realize that the previous case, singletons and, and pairs, in, in the most case, are just a special case. But now I, I allow more, I allow larger uh, intervals. And uh, you, you might notice the, the, the intervals up appearing in this sense uh, in, in simplicial complexes, they always come in powers of two. So now we, here I have a green, uh, a, a green interval consisting of four synthesis, a vertex, two edges, and a triangle. The, it will always be a power of two. Okay, and that's that's also okay. And then I just extend my notion of gen generalized discrete Morse uh, uh, Morse function to to adopt this new notion of vector field. And I need them way back, right? Because now I just invent a new notion, but the point is I can simply carry over the results from Morse theory to this generalized setting because I can simply refine these intervals into pairs. And there's a very simple explicit construction to do this. I choose, I simply choose a single vertex and it should be a vertex of uh, the larger simplex, in this case the triangle, that's not a vertex of the smaller simplex the smaller simplex is the vertex on top. And then how do I, how do I part, further partition this cluster of four simplices into pairs as required by discrete Morse theory? I simply co collect the pairs of simplices not containing that chosen red vertex and then I include that red vertex, gives me a, a, a high dimensional simplex and these are, these are pairs. These, these are pairs that give a gradient. So in a nutshell, whenever I have a, a, an interval of synthesis, I can refine by choosing a, a vertex towards the gradient should point. So there's a nice way of resolving the situation, and that means I can simply pretend 
to work in the standard setting of discrete Morse theory. And in particular, my, my collapsing result also applies to this setting. And now that's great because the Czech function and the Delaunay function are generalized discrete Morse functions. And you know more, that they, they actually share a very close connection. Uh, we have a critical simplex of the Czech if and only if we have a critical simplex of the Delaunay triangulation. The function values also have to coincide. The critical simplices are precisely those Delaunay simplices whose circumsphere has a center inside that simplex. As you can see here, there's a centered Delaunay simplex. And those are precisely the critical points of both functions and the function values coincide. And for all the non-critical synthesis, the Delaunay function is strictly greater to the Czech function. So this is exactly, the critical synthesis are exactly where the function values meet. Okay, how do you see, how, how can we show that this is true, that, that Czech and Delaunay function are generalized discrete Morse function? In other words, the synthesis sharing the same sphere defining the function value, they have to come in intervals, in phase intervals. Let me just illustrate, because I, I think it's very, very uh, illustrative to just see what, what these intervals are. So I start with a simplex Q, and I'm asking myself, what other simplices have the same Czech sphere, the same smallest enclosing sphere? If I, if a uh, simplex R has the same smallest enclosing sphere as Q, this is the case if and only if R contains the points that, of Q that lie on the sphere, right? Because if I dropped any of the points that lie on the sphere, I could use a smaller sphere. This is these are the points that keep the sphere in shape, that, that constrain the size of the sphere. If you think that the sphere wants to shrink and the points on the sphere keep it from shrinking further. That's some kind of clear geometric intuition. Why, why any point that has this yellow sphere as the smallest circumsphere, as the smallest enclosing sphere, um, has to contain all of the points lying on the sphere. On, on the other hand, um, if R is a simplex with that smallest enclosing sphere, it has to be, clearly it has to be, the vertices of R have to be contained in a set of points that are enclosed by that sphere. Any, asking for any other point outside to be enclosed would necessarily have to enlarge the sphere. So this is how you can see these must be the lower and upper bounds, a kind of hand-waving way, but this is how you maybe get to the observation that there's actually intervals defining the simplices having, having a given smallest enclosing sphere. And there's a something, so you can also write it in, in interval notation, R is contained in this interval. With lower bound, the points on the sphere, upper bound, the points enclosed by that sphere. Right. Okay, and there's a similar picture for Delaunay. I, I need to introduce some language to uh, explain what happens in the Delaunay case. So let's say we, we consider the smallest circumsphere of a simplex and that simplex is precisely, the vertices of that simplex are precisely the points on that sphere. And I can write the center of that sphere S as an affine combination of the points on the sphere. So here's the center. And now I, I use two colors. If I, if I write the center as an affine combination of these three points, the yellow point will get a negative coefficient in the affine combination, and the green points will get a positive coefficient. And, and geometrically, you can see this by the fact that the center is opposite to 
the yellow point with respect to the remaining points. Whereas all the other points are on the same side of, of the hyperplanes bent by the remaining points. On the same side, like for example, this vertex is on the same side of the remaining, the remaining points as the center. And that's why the ones that are on the same side are called front. They see the simplex from the front, if you want. And, uh, and, and, and this one is on the back, right? seen from, from the center. So this is where, where this front and back rotation comes from. So there's one yellow simplex hidden in the back, but the other ones, the green ones, are in front. And I can use this um, language to talk about to what, what simplices have the same smallest empty circumsphere, the same DeLong sphere. Let's play the game again. Uh, so here, by the way, here's an example. This is the centered simplex again, and here everything is in front because all the all the coefficients in this uh, in this affine uh, combination expressing the center, all the coefficients are positive. Okay, and the, and the Delaunay phase intervals are described as follows. Again, I want to look at a specific simplex Q, and I want to ask myself, what are the other simplices that have the same smallest empty circumsphere as this one? Right. And, and now I see that something, so you, you want to somehow uh, include or exclude points from Q and you want to see whether the smallest empty circumsphere would shrink as, as, as a result. Right. So, um, every simplex R with that smallest empty circumsphere has to contain the vertices in the front. Because if you imagine you remove one of these two vertices, the green vertices, you could get a smaller empty circumsphere. You could shrink it. These two points are the points that push the sphere outward and keep it from shrinking. But you can remove the third point, the one that's on the back. Because that point will still, even if it's not required to be on the sphere, it will require to, it will still give a constraint because the sphere still re needs to remain empty of all the points in, in my point set. So whether or not I ask this f point in the back to be included in, in the sphere, it, it will, it will uh, carry a constraint. And th that's why this point is not in the lower bound. I can remove this point. The upper bound is given. Uh, because I'm asking for a circumsphere, circumsphere means a sphere containing all the points of R. And so the, the, the upper bound is the points that, all the points that lie on the sphere. I can't, I can't ask for any more points that would have to change the sphere. So this is how, how uh, the interval is described in the, uh, in the Delaunay case. This is, these are hand-waving arguments. I mean, the, the, supposed to somehow illustrate that it's plausible to expect that you have intervals. But there's a principal approach to, to actually prove why these are intervals. And I can cover both cases with the same argument. And it's an argument that you might like because in, if you work in machine learning, you have to work a lot with optimization. And it's an, actually an uh, argument from nonlinear optimization. And to go there, we are, are going to generalize and to something called the selective Delaunay complexes that captures both Czech and Delaunay. Both, both are defined using smallest spheres satisfying a certain constraint. When minimizing the radius, we have a set of points that should be inside the sphere. We have a point of set of points that should be outside the sphere. Always weak inequalities, the, the points can also lie on the sphere. But that's the general optimization problem in which I, I, I phrase construction, right? So uh, in the check case, nothing is, nothing is excluded, right? I just ask for points to be included. In the Delaunay case, the entire point set X is excluded. But they're both, in that sense, they're both special cases of this problem here. 
Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna convert the problem to a, a nicer form. Maybe I wanna get it into a form with quadratic objective function and affine constraints. That's, that's good for optimization, as you probably know. So I, instead of minimizing the radius, I can minimize the radius squared. I square everything here. And then I just, I, I, I want to get rid in the, in the constraints, subject two, I want to get rid of quadratic terms. So I'm, I'm going to expand the square. First, I'm going to introduce a new variable. I'm going to replace the radius squared by cent, norm of the center squared minus a. So this is just change of variables. That's going to be useful in a moment. And then I'm going to expand the terms z minus q squared and z minus e squared. So I'm expanding this. Why? Now I can cancel the z squared term. And I will be left only with linear terms in, in my variables. Right? So I'm, I'm canceling the z squareds in the constraints. And there's a q squared left, but that's, that's q and e, those are data points. Right? Those are the points that should be included or excluded. And they are no longer variables. So now I have the problem in a form where the objective function is quadratic, the constraints are linear. That's good. And it's, it's the same. So, so here's general solution theory for nonlinear problems, right? Karush Tucker conditions. If I have a minimization problem and I have constraints, like inequality and equality constraints, the function is convex, so quadratic function is convex, and my constraint functions are affine. Then there's a condition, if and only if, condition for a point to be optimal, right? A, a, an assignment of variables to be optimal. I have these stationarity conditions, uh, I have complementary slackness, and I have dual feasibility. And I can simply take this. Uh, this is something probably most of you know. Uh, if, if you don't, uh, I'll just make this explicit, right? Because we have an optimization problem of this form. We have, we minimizing with respect to inequality and equality constraints. And in my special case, it takes this form, which is rather geometric. So a sphere S that encloses a, a, a set of points Q and excludes another set E. And this sphere is minimal if and only if I can write the center as an affine combination. Uh, you recognize I've talked about this before. This is, uh, yeah, this, this is what you get from, from the, uh, from the, sorry, that's the, this is what you get from stationarity, basically. This translates into this, writing the center as an affine combination, and then the other conditions tell me um, whenever a point does not lie on the sphere, the Lagrange multiplier, this, this lambda x should be equal to zero. And if the point x is excluded but not, should not be at the same time not be included, then it, the Lagrange multiplier has to be negative. And, in, and then there's the opposite case. If, it's, if the point has to be included but should not be excluded, the multiplier has to be positive. Okay, even more geometrically. I'm just transforming this, right? So you don't have to pay attention. This is just what comes out of plugging in my optimization function into the general theory. And I can simply use, now I can use the language of front and back to make this even more geometric. This gives me, this gives me a nice general picture here. A sphere enclosing a point set Q and excluding another point set E is minimal if and only if this S is the smallest circumsphere of the points in the points that lie on that, that sphere. And then I have two, well, I, I just re rephrase everything now in, 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 the, in the interval language, and, it, and the conditions read, Q is contained in the interval with lower bound the front of S, and upper bound the enclosed points of S, and another condition tells me that excluded points are in the interval from back to the excluded points. Now that's very close, but so that's kind of the general result, and we can specialize to learn that the Czech faces are of this form that we've seen. Lower bound is the points on the sphere, and upper bound the enclosed points. Why, why, why do 
you have on here. So this is because for the Czech intervals, uh, we know that the back, it, the back of the sphere is a subset of the excluded points, but the excluded points, we, we didn't exclude any points. So E is an empty set, meaning the back of the sphere is empty, meaning the front is everything. So this is why the, the statement in the proposition that Q cont is contained in this interval from front to enclosed points, well, we know in this case the front consists of all points on the sphere. In other words, for the, for the Czech spheres, uh, no point lies in the back. And similarly, we also get the result for the Delaunay faces you know, of the form. The lower bound is the front, and the upper bound are the points on the sphere. Again, this is a bit changed from, from the statement in the proposition, but that's again because in the Delaunay case, we, we're working with empty spheres. So the points that are, lie on the sphere are already all the points that are enclosed by the sphere. There's no point in the interior. Okay, so that's, that's how you get this form. And then uh, let me just show an illustration, right, how, how this gradient looks like. In, in the 2D case, we actually don't have larger intervals than pairs. And here's a, here's a point cloud, and here's the Delaunay triangulation. And, well, here's one, here, here you see the gradient. Here, here are all the pairs. So here, this, these are the critical synthesis, the two and, and three dimensional, but also according to this definition, every vertex is critical. And then here's a pair, here's another pair. You also see something like, if I show you these two pictures, these two slides, there's something like a gradient flow here. And this kind of gradient flow, if you, if you want to follow my hand waving, this will be used to define this other nice wrap complex that, that captures the geometry of the point set as closely as possible. So, so here, here you see the entire collection into uh, critical and non-critical simplices. Anyway, we go a step further and define the wrap complexes. Um, as I mentioned, this is this has been used for surface reconstruction, so this is why it's called wrap. We're wrapping a piece of uh, uh, tin foil around the bunny. This is what you would get with the Delaunay complex. This is also called alpha shapes, and you see why this is well. Topologically, it's okay, but geometrically, it's not very pleasing. The bunny has a collar. Right? So there, there's some geometric artifacts that you want to get rid of. And the wrap complex will give you this result, which look, it looks much nicer. So this is a very nice and clean geometric reconstruction. This is just, what's that? The famous bunny. Yeah, the famous bunny, exactly. And that, that, um, that's, a, that's now a, a simplicial complex that's homotopy equivalent to all the wild things we've seen before. And how, how, how do you get this? We consider this Delaunay gradient that we have seen before, and we define the wrap complex as follows. We, for a radius R, we start with all synthesis, all critical synthesis below that radius, and then we con try to construct the smallest complex. We, we try to add all the faces. But at the same time, whenever we add a face, we want to add the entire, uh, all, all, all of his friends in the, in the, uh, in the Delaunay gradient. So we, we only add uh, intervals in the, in the Delaunay gradient, not, not single faces. Let me show what, this, what I mean by this. So, so we start with the critical simplices. Here's a critical simplex, let's say, below my threshold. And I add its faces, and for each, of the faces, I also add the uh, the other uh, the other synthesis that lie in the same interval. So now this continues, and you see what this the effect of this is that you basically flow downwards uh, along the gradient, uh, and you extend the critical simplex to a larger cell. And you flow and flow until you uh, reach uh, until you stay. And you do this for every critical simplex below the threshold, and this gives you the wrap complex. And now by construction, you included 
you build a complex out of pairs, in this case, out of, of intervals in, in the Delaunay gradient, and you included all the critical simplices. That means the complement also consists only of pairs, and so immediately you have that this collapses, uh, that the Delaunay complex collapses onto this web complex. Because this is by, by the collapsing theorem, we have the Delaunay complex, we have the smaller wrap complex, and its complement consists only of pairs in the Delaunay gradient, and hence we have this complex. And you can see the, the here explicitly, you can see the collapse from the outside. There's these gray arrows, the gray pairs remaining, and this, is, this shows you how to collapse from the Delaunay to the wrap complex. Okay, so that, that's all I, I wanted to uh, say about Czech and Delaunay. Uh, are there any, any questions about this before I continue with, with the other construction, RIPS construction? Okay, I want to start with uh, a question that I think came up yesterday during the tutorial. Some people struggled with, um, with where exactly uh, uh, a, a bar in the interval is born and where it dies, what does this mean geometrically? So let me recall the definition quickly. The Vitor's Ribs complex is again a, an abstract simplicial complex. The simplices are subsets of my point set X. I only have pairwise distances. I only have a distance matrix. I don't know any embedding. And, and then, so any, any subset of X whose diameter is below my threshold so all pairwise distances are below the threshold, um, form a simplex. So this is defined purely, it's, it's enough to know uh, the edges, and then all possible higher dimensional simplices are also included. It's called a clique complex because the simplices are cliques in this graph, in the geometric graph formed by pairs with distance and most t. The problem, as I mentioned before, the number of simplices grows very quickly, and that makes this this uh, object a very challenging uh, beast to deal with. Um, okay, here's a point cloud you've seen before yesterday. And I ran the computation for RIPS barcodes and I computed uh, the, the cycles generating an interval and then the bounds, uh, the, the, the chains bounding it. And here you can, I can illustrate uh, what the birth and death is. So this is a cycle. This is the cycle that generates the, the long, there's, there's one long interval. Maybe I can also go to, um, yeah, this, is the, this is the computation done in RIPSA. And you see there's a bit of noise here in dimension one. There's a long interval here. That corresponds to this cycle that you see here. That, that generates a hole that's filled in only later. By the way, so there was also this question about homology H0, homology in degree zero, in dimension zero, in, in, in dimension one. And somehow I'm only, show, usually I'm showing only up, starting from one because that's interesting, but also in dimension zero, there's something very interesting. This persistent homology of dimension zero, homology in dimension zero basically talks about connected components, right? So. Any, anything, uh, any linear combination of points is a cycle, and the boundary is, uh, well, is connecting to a boundary, let's say you have a, you have a chain of edges with two endpoints, the boundary consists of two points, and then uh, that, that, that means that the components of these two points are, are merged. So what that means, this persistence barcode in dimension zero is basically showing um, information that you see in the dendrogram. This is capturing the, uh, what you get from single linkage clustering. And the way to compute this is to uh, compute uh, the minimum spanning tree using Kruskal's algorithm. Right? So you, you, if, if, you, if you consider the, the graph whose edges uh, have weights, the distances, and then you consider the minimum spanning tree, each of the edges in the minimum spanning tree connects to components. And all of the non-tree edges actually create a one cycle. And the, the deaths of these intervals in dimension zero 
correspond exactly to two components merging, right? So the components are born at level zero, the points are there from the beginning, and the death is always when two components merge. So homology in degree zero co corresponds to merging of connected components, and that's in the clustering language, that's single language clustering. So that's, that's uh, homo and, and this is just applying the definition of homology cycles, modular boundaries, to uh, linear combinations, chains, cycles in, in dimension zero, this means linear combinations of the vertices of the points. And boundaries are on like linear combinations of boundaries of edges. Each edge has two boundary points. Okay, so here you see what happens in dimension zero. This is basically the dendrogram with, with the, well, you, 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 you cut the branches um, away. So, and, and what remains is this persistence barcode. In, in dimension one, you, you see this, this one dimensional cycle here. And the values here, the birth and the death value, um, geometrically, they correspond to the longest edge. So, so here, in red, you see uh, the cycle, and in uh, light shaded blue, it's almost invisible, unfortunately, on the, on the big screen, but maybe on the smaller screen, you see that there's a certain shading. There's a, there's a, a kind of folded over disk that's bounded by this red curve. And that's the two chain that bounds this one cycle. The two chain is a linear combination of triangles. Unfortunately, they're barely visible. You only see they, they, get, uh, they get blue here and when, when there's fold over. I, I recommend that you look at the screen that the, the shading is a bit more visible. So there's kind of a, a, a two-dimensional disk and here some of the simplices are folded over and the boundary of this whole thing is the red one. So the birth, so th this corresponds to birth and death in homology. The birth is precisely the longest edge in the, in the red chain, in the red cycle. That's the one you see here on top. And then the death is when the triangle with the largest diameter in the blue bounding chain appears for the first time. That's the triangle in the middle. I don't know exactly, I think this edge here, the edge from top left to bottom is the longest edge in this triangle. This is when this triangle ends, hence when the entire chain is present in the filtration for the first time. That means when this, this cap for the cycle is there for the first time, when the cycle is filled in again. Okay, so that's the geometry. And the length of, of the thick yet, uh, red edge corresponds to the birth and the length of this edge for the blue triangle corresponds to its death. But that's kind of a geometric picture. And the, and the, you see that this, this picture is a bit ugly and that's, that's because we're actually working in a very high dimensional complex. But if you worked with the Delaunay complexes we've seen before, the picture would be much cleaner. Okay. Um, I want to show two interesting data sets before I go in, maybe into a bit of the theory. So this is something you might know. This is a collection of uh, images taken with like rotations of five degree from different objects. And you see why, why I'm mentioning this data set because it has interesting topology. It, it, it's, it's sampled from, from a circle, right? I'm, I'm, I'm rotating the, the cat around the circle. And now I wanna just use these images as high dimensional data points. I wanna do something very stupid that I shouldn't do, but it still works. Surprisingly, I want to simply take every, I don't know, it's like 180, uh, 128 squared uh, pixel. I have three color values. I just consider this as a high dimensional Euclidean vector, which is not a good idea in, in, in terms of uh, image uh, in, in computer vision because I lose all the, all the spatial information of nearby pixels. But surprisingly, it still works. That's because the pictures are so similar and they are slightly blurry. That also helps. And and then I, so I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna load this, this simply as a high dimensional Euclidean point cloud. And this is the data set. It's a point cloud. Is 
is not working. Can I just check? Oh yeah, okay, it is working. And what you see here, it su works surprisingly well. I get this long interval in dimension one, and that corresponds to the circle. And then there's only a few artifacts. So that's that's nice. And that's that's kind of showing that in some cases, I mean, even though I did something very stupid, I, I should I should use a better way to compare images in, in, in general. But in, in this case it was worked good enough so I could actually recover the circle underlying the state of set. Yes? It's, it's a circle re representing the movement, right? Because the, the, the way these images are taken, this is parameterized over a, a full 360 degree rotation. Yeah, exactly. And that's the, that's the circle that we cover. Maybe what's also interesting is to look at, um, again, H0, right, the, the, the connected components. Let's just visualize that. Is this taking so long? Yeah. So this, this shows you how, where, what's the largest distance between two cats before, I, before the circle is closed. And it's happening right here before then actually the, the cycle appears. So this is where, this is, this is the point where my complexes get connected for the first time and then the next edge actually creates a cycle. Okay, right here at, at 5,400 it gets connected and here at distance 6,000 the cycle is strong for the first time. Another nice data set. Now I have to be a bit more clever. I want to prove that the Earth is not a disk. And why, I mean, these, I want to use, and prove it using pictures that show the Earth as a disk. Yeah, so, I mean, if, I, if you show this picture to someone who doesn't believe you, then they would say, uh, that, yeah, you see, it's a disk. I mean, now I'm, I, I moved the center of this projection to Munich because we, in Munich we believe that Munich is the center of the world. And now the, the, the idea is I take many pictures of the Earth. I, I take enough that I, I should have overlap. I should have, uh, for each picture, I should have another picture that's similar enough. And then I can, I, I try to compute in, a, in the best possible way pairwise distances. And I want to feed this into persistent homology. I want to construct ribs complexes from the pairwise distances. And each image of the Earth here corresponds to a certain point on the sphere. And I have, I have distances between, I have the geodesic distances on the sphere. And I just try to estimate my distances from the images in the best possible way and compare them to the actual geodesic distances. And just using onboard methods from Mathematica that allow me to take two images and align them, as you can see here. Yeah. I have two images that, that, that are centered in not so different places. It, it won't work if the, the points are too far apart, but I only need things to meet up in a, uh, at small scales to apply the, my inference theorem, right? And, and, uh, and, and to, to, to use stability of persistence diagrams. Because uh, the, the point is I can, I, now I can try to align the images and from how much I have to shift one image to align it to the other, I can get an estimate, geometric estimate of the angle between the two points uh, centered at the, at the globes. I estimate this angle and I can, since I know the ground truth, I can compare my estimate to the, the, the correct value and I can actually compute with Mathematica that, that for small values this works very, very precisely. So I know, because I have a proof about stability, I know that I will get a correct result. And then I can just go to RIPSA and do the computation, I think is open here. So this is, um, is this? Let's see. I only go to yeah. So this is the these are the true distances. I only want to go to up to a certain distance because I know the, the the method will eventually fail if if I can't get the images to match. So I'm only looking at small distances. This is the 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 correct barcode right the, from from the my sample of points on the sphere. 
you, you see this looks very regular. That's because I try to sample in a way that minimizes, um, uh, that, that, that maximizes the, the optimizes the distribution of the points on the sphere. So I, I didn't just sample randomly, but I tried to minimize the, the, the sampling error. And now let me load the other file with the estimated distances. And I want to also go just up to distance 0 0.5. And I want to compute homology up to dimension 2. And you see this looks very similar. And also here, this is what I want to get at. This is the, the appearance of the fundamental class, the orientation class of, of the sphere. This is my, uh, my indication that the Earth has to actually form a sphere. This wouldn't be there otherwise. And you see, uh, you see here what, what's actually the stability theorem proves us, and we, we see indication of that the barcodes are reasonably similar. In particular, what's, what's striking that the, the point at which the two-dimensional class appears seems to be almost the same. There's very little difference. You know, if you see it moving, it moves, but only very slightly. Okay. So this is, this is a nice of illustration of what kind of, what kind of things you can do with topological data analysis. I mean, I think people uh, sometimes oversell TDA as the solution to everything. That's clearly not the case. It, it solves problems that have that are topological or geometric in nature. I mean, but it's several, like it's, many problems have some topological component, right? If you, in, in computer vision, for example, you often deal with orientations, and like the the, the, the space of orientations of a camera is SO3 cross R3. That's a manifold that has complicated topology, right? It's interesting topology. The SO3 part is a projective plane, and in, in many scenarios, you have to be aware of that, and you have to work around the fact that you're not working in a in a in a space with trivial topology, and that's that's where you might want to um, consider methods from topological data analysis. Um, okay, so that's two example computations. Uh, let me say a few words about the software I'm using here. Uh, um, I have maybe 15 minutes, so um, Ripsa is. is uh, uh, a few, just a, thousand, a few thousand lines of C++ code, we can compute homology with coefficients. I haven't really talked much about this, but for those who know, uh, prime fields are supported. Sparse distance matrices, this is, this is quite important. I don't have to compute the entire filtration, but often I just want to cut as a threshold. This is what I've done just in the example. I, I only computed up to a certain distance. And that, that gives me a big speed up, right, because I, the, the, the matrix, uh, the, 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 the distance matrix up to that point might still be sparse and the computation will be much faster. That's, that's an important property. It's open source, MIT licensed, and I've showed you the online version. And, and the RIPs have won an award for best new software in, in applied topology a few years ago. Um, I, I want to just say a few words about why, uh, where these big improvements in computation time come from. So there's something interesting. There's a few observations that maybe people have missed in the first round of software. But there's also something that's interesting in general, I think, for matrix computation. I'm, I'm throwing away a large part of the, of the things I'm computing, and I'm recreating them on the fly instead of reading them from memory. And that seems like a stupid idea, but it, it, it turned out to be a lead to a big improvement in computation time. So maybe that's an interesting uh, thing for uh, in, in general interesting observation for things that can happen when you try something crazy in computations. What we learned from previous methods, uh, there, there are two uh, optimizations, clearing and cohomology. I'm, I'm going to say in a moment what that means. And, and they, they lead to big speed ups, and, but, but only if, if you use both of them uh, in conjunction. Um, let me just illustrate how, how I actually compute the homology and persistent homology. Um, the homology was defined. Uh, if, if here, here you see the formula for the first time. I said it yesterday. So we write H, H star. This is the homology group. It's a quotient vector space of the cycles modulo the boundaries. The boundaries are always cycles, and so you can form this quotient space. 
And so H homology is, is defined as this quotient space. How do you compute a basis for a quotient space? This is basically in your algebra. You first compute a basis for the smaller space, for the boundaries. Then you do a basis extension. You extend the boundary basis to a cycle basis. And everything you added to the boundaries, all the non-boundary cycles that you added, they form basis cycles for, for homology. So this is just a very simple general statement about bases, basis extensions, and quotients of vector spaces. And that's what we're doing. That's how you compute homology when, when you work uh, over fields or when you work in linear algebra. Interestingly, persistent homology is no, no more complicated. You, basically, you do the same thing. Now you compute a filtered basis for the boundaries. That means you have a basis for the entire complex, and whenever you restrict to an earlier complex in the filtration, you just take a subset of the basis, and that also works. So that's a filtration-compatible basis. You extend that to a basis for the cycles of the final complex, and, and now it turns out that all these cycles uh, are the generators for, so each, each cycle that you see here is a generator for some interval in the barcode as we've seen before. So as, as in my previous example, there was the cycle that's eventually capped by, it, it gets a cap and gets filled in, and, and I take these here as, as uh, basis cycles for, for, the, um, for, for the boundaries and, and, and for the cycles. So here's some, some notation. Um, by the, by the way, this, the first time this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, computation of, uh, of persistent homology in explicit form in, in, in basis uh, cycles and boundaries, capping these cycles, was done in the 90s by Sergei Baranikov, who's also here in Skoltek. And it, that was not, that was before topological data analysis was really popularized. It, was, it, it happened in the context of, discrete, of, of smooth Morse theory. But most theory and, and, and persistent homology are closely related, as we have mentioned yesterday. Okay, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the algorithm on an example showing the matrix and the filtration on top and the chains corresponding to columns in the matrix. Before that, I'm going to introduce some notation. D is going to be the, the matrix encoding the boundary map. The boundary is a linear map, and I, I encode it by saying, What's the boundary of every simplex? So I want to, the persistent homology barcodes, and my notation for a column of the matrix, capital M is M sub J, and then the pivot index is simply the, the largest index of a non-zero entry, and the pivot index is zero if the entire column is zero. And the computation is done by matrix reduction. That means I transform the boundary matrix into reduced form. This is, this is a very similar to Gaussian elimination. I, I want to make sure that the reduced matrix has distinct pivots, and I want to transform it by a full rank upper triangular matrix, multiplication from the right. So I apply column operations, adding columns from left to right to perform elimination of pivots. So this is really like Gaussian elimination, based on columns instead of rows, and without the swapping of, of columns. And that, that way I keep my information compatible with the filtration. And then um, after, after the fact I can, the, the, the columns that are reduced to zero correspond to the birth of homology, the other ones correspond to the, the death of homology, the end of an interval, and whatever, whenever I have a birth index, it doesn't appear as the pivot of a reduced column, then this means that homology is born at that index, but it never dies, and that's what we call essential homology and essential indices. And, and all, this somehow uses the observation that all the pivot indices in the reduced column, so whenever I have a, I have a, a death index, the, the column, at that index corresponds to a cycle that's born at some point. When is it born exactly? At, at its pivot, the latest index where it appears. I think the, and then you can read off the intervals. So, so uh, the, the 
birth and the death of an interval corresponds exactly to uh, the column index is the death and the row index of the pivot is the birth. And the essential indices correspond to intervals that extend to infinity. Let me illustrate this on an example that's, that's easy to see. Okay, so here is a filtration with seven steps. I'm adding one simplex at a time. I start with a vertex, two vertices, then an edge, adding another vertex, another edge, another edge, triangle. And I start with R as the boundary matrix. So you can see in R, the columns correspond exactly to boundaries of the simplices that appear at the corresponding index. At index five, there's an edge appearing, and it has two boundary vertices, namely the vertex appearing at one and the vertex appearing at four. Okay, so that's what I start with. Now I try to, I see that this matrix is not reduced because I have two columns with the same pivot index, the same uh, lowest non-zero entry. Here, the, all the pivots of the non-zero columns are highlighted, and I have to, in red, and I have to eliminate. So I, I, I perform column addition, adding column five to column six to eliminate. And you see now on top, the color coding always corresponds to the, the, the content of the columns. So at step six, What's, what's shown in red is the column in V. This is some chain, right? It's a linear combination of, in this case, a linear combination of edges, edge six and edge five, the edge appearing at, at level six and the one appearing at level five. And in R, you see the representation of the corresponding boundary. So the boundary of this chain consisting of two edges and that's colored in blue here, two vertices in blue, and, and these are exactly, uh, the con this is exactly the content of the column number six in the matrix R. Right. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the picture showing chains here and their boundaries and the content of the matrix. And I'm continuing to eliminate entries I'm adding a column three to column six to eliminate the pivot. And then what I, what I managed to do is I, I zeroed out this column six. And that tells me that a cycle is born at step six. And here you see the cycle. And wh why do you know that a cycle is born? Because uh, column six in R is empty. Column six, column R six is the boundary of V six. So here's a chain whose boundary is empty. That's a cycle. So now in column six in V, I, I see a cycle. I know that there's a birth here. Okay. Um, yeah, I have five more minutes. So so uh, that that's the basic algorithm in a sense. It's just Gaussian elimination. But now the next observation was I don't. I wouldn't have to do this, this operation. And if you do this on large complexes, now I, I identified a birth. But in fact, I could have known this birth before because I can just look at column seven in R and I see the same cycle, right? Column seven in R is the same as column six in V. So in the boundary matrix, I could al already read off a cycle and I could tell immediately that this is a birth cycle because I couldn't the, the pivot is already unique. I couldn't reduce this any further. That means this cycle appearing at level six is born at level six. It, it doesn't come from anything earlier. So, and that, that's an important observation that eventually was made. If you just naively apply Gaussian elimination to compute homology, you're doing a lot of computations that are completely unnecessary. You know exactly, so how can you avoid this? This is a column that appears, the column index appears as a pivot. Column six appears as a pivot. The index six appears as a pivot of column seven. So, and you know, whenever that's the case, you don't have to touch this column. It has to uh, go to zero eventually. And you don't have to perform that computation. So that was one, one big uh, 
important step. We call it clearing. We know there are certain columns that, that are never used and that will be reduced to zero if we perform the elimination, but we try to avoid that. And that gives us big speed up. So in order to notice that a column doesn't have to be touched before, uh, before we actually do the reduction, right, we have to know in advance that it, it's, it's going to be a pivot. And now we have to do the, we have to perform the computations in, 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 in different dimensions individually. We have, in, in particular, we have to start from top dimension and then go down. And, and that way we can identify which, which columns can simply be skipped and left out. But if you want to start in top dimension, in, 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 kind of in, in the top dimension itself, you can't use this shortcut because you don't have any information from the previous step. And that's why if you do the counting here, I don't know, um, I, I just filled in the numbers for, for the example of the sphere. You save a little bit, right? You save, in this, in this uh, example, we have 50 million columns and we save 1.1 million columns. But we still have to do the hard work in top dimension for 53 million, right? 53 out of 56. So we, we saved only a small percentage. That's what, because we needed to go from high to low dimension. And now the next insight was, there's, we, we can also do, we can perform the same on the transpose matrix. This essentially means we're working in cohomology instead of homology. We get the same information if we do the operations on the transpose matrix, but now we can start from dimension zero and be going up in dimension. And then all of a sudden, well, in dimension zero, we can do something special anyway. We can use, as I said, we can use Kruskal's algorithm. This is very fast. And then we are already started. We have some information for the next step. We know which columns we don't have to touch. And then all of a sudden, the speed up that we get here is substantial, right? We, I mean, first of all, the, the matrices, they are very asymmetric. We have way more, uh, in, in this case, we have way more rows than columns. And we, we are saving, like, out of 1.1 1. Uh, 1 million, we are saving 18,000. That doesn't seem like a lot, but as it turns out, those are the columns that are hard computationally. That, that's where all the computational power goes into, into unnecessary computations. And what we're left with is typically uh, just, uh, what, when we, we know what columns to skip, surprisingly, we end up uh, performing column operations only on very few columns. So then the entire computation, all of a sudden, after we rearrange things appropriately, the, the entire uh, remaining uh, Gaussian elimination method doesn't have to do that much work anymore. We almost have no, no column additions to perform. And that's, that's, where we, that's where we get a big speed up, basically. Um, maybe I, I can stop at this point. There's a few more things I could say. Um, well, maybe, let me just add this one thing. But because we're observing that we, we have to perform so, so few column additions, so most of the columns in this, in this matrix that we consider are reduced from the beginning. And then the, 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 the last idea I want to mention is we, we're not even storing the matrix that we're working with in its entirety. The boundary matrix, the matrix, the input matrix, is something that can be given uh, computationally. It, the columns can be computed on the fly. And we, we're transforming this to another matrix but whenever we, we have finalized a column, all we remember is its pivot and we throw away the rest. Because we can, and, and what we also remember is, is the transformation matrix, transforming the initial matrix to this reduced matrix. But this matrix is much smaller. And as I said, it, it, because we perform almost no operations, it's, it's almost diagonal with very few off diagonal entries. So somehow we're, in, we, we're, we're saying, okay, it's so unlikely if, that I will ever reuse one of the columns in my reduced matrix that whenever I have to, I will recreate it from the, uh, uh, from the coefficient matrix, which is much smaller. And that, that gave another big speed up in the computation time. Yeah, so I guess that's, that's a good point to stop. Here is a 
just uh, uh, an interesting Google Analytics map showing where people use the live version of Ripster. So the, at the time I took this picture was 770 different locations. So it seems that a lot of people are trying to play with it. And here are uh, a few references for, for papers discussing the topics I mentioned. Thank you. <laughs>